D. D, how are you doing? I'm good, Polly. How are you doing? Are you feeling okay? What time is it for you? Uh, it's 9.46 p.m. I'm first, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time. I know it's late for you um, right now because you're from Uganda, but right now you are based in South Africa. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. But it's literally almost the same time. It's like one okay. hour ahead, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm very familiar with your work, but I know not everyone is. So please take us to where your journey starts. Oh, um, thank you so much, Polly, first of all, for um, inviting me. This is like really special, so I'm really excited. Um, so I am Dilovi Kwagala. I am um, from Uganda, but I'm currently based in South Africa. I would say I'm a documentary or I'm, I'm a storyteller. I'm a photographer and um, the first non-binary queer photographer and activist in the whole of Uganda. And uh, my work um, revolves around gender identity, belonging, um, and sexuality. And um, yeah, it just goes over, like I'm really passionate about like human rights and all of that. So I always, you know, kind of um, tend to explore identity in its broadity within um, that same context, you know, of like um, belonging and home and um, human rights as well. Yeah. What made you, I mean, what led you to, you know, capture those stories? I guess, you know, how are you gravitating, gravitating towards that? So my history, <laughs> How did I get to start doing the stories that I'm doing? So, um, as I said, I'm non-binary queer and I come from a very homophobic um, country. So Uganda is literally known for its homophobia, which is like really weird to be known about, but like Google tells you all of that. Anyway, um, there was, I remember when I was starting out or like I did buy a camera at some point and I was just using it as, you know, like a hobby, uh, some passion thing and like, you know, photographing my friends here and, and you know, like out and about. And um, at some point I was really, really desperate for a job and I ended up taking um, taking a job as a host, a ho like a restaurant host. So it's just like welcoming uh, people and stuff. And apparently I didn't look the image. And um, I had dreads, which were not firm enough. And um, I'm a masculine queer. So obviously that also was a problem. Um, they told me after they gave me the job that I needed to buy uh, women, femi feminine, not women, feminine clothes. And um, I went and did an attempt, which was to get like office pants, right? You know, to still kind of like feel a bit more in my skin. And um, after a week or two, they called me in and told me that um, still I wasn't presentable enough. I wasn't formal enough to them and that it was a problem to their um, customers and clients. And so they literally got the manager, a lady, to go with me to the market. And I remember they actually took from the salary they were supposed to give me for that month and used it to shop for me clothes, uh, which included skirts and dresses and uh, makeup as well and high heels. And because, I mean, I am a parent too, I have an eight year old and um, I needed to provide for my family. I guess I feel like everyone kind of understands the black tax, you know? <laughs> And um, within my case, I've been um, the sole provider of my family since I was 17. So. It just kind of like, you know, it's an obligation which you keep on like having to fulfill. And with that moment, it's just like, I didn't have a choice. The money wasn't even great, but I was like, I need to be earning something. So to send home to my child as well. And um, that job lasted for two months. And I will tell you this, it was literally like the worst depressive. I mean, I guess there's like more depressive times that are coming, but I just felt like that was like the worst dep dis depressive um period of my life because it just felt like I was selling my soul to the devil like I was literally getting rid of all my identity to fit a certain um criteria you know just for the money which wasn't it was literally like what a hundred fifty dollars a month 
<laughs> it doesn't even make any sense. But again, that's where I was in the, at, 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 the, at the moment. And um, within that time also, I was, you know, I had come out as queer to, you know, like, um, obviously myself. I had just started accepting the fact that I was queer because I grew up, you know, questioning this and like trying to fight it. For the longest time, because I'm like, okay, it's a taboo. I grew up in church and like all they talk about is like Sodom and Gomorrah and like how they burnt the city because people were homosexuals. And so I fought that so hard that I had to go and um, convince myself to date a man and ended up with a child because I needed to prove myself that I wasn't gay because how dare you be gay in Uganda, you know? And so obviously because also there was no representation and all of that, and no internet because I came late to the game. So it was really hard to find representation and all of that. So after going through that um, excruciating, painful job experience, I decided, I remember that I had a camera and I decided to quit. And I told myself that I'm not working for any person. I was going to swear. I don't know if that's allowed. <laughs> Oh, I want us to keep it real and honest. <laughs> okay, so I literally said I'm gonna I'm not gonna work for any motherfuckers <laughs> ever. <laughs> not like that. And so I picked up my camera and I told myself that I was gonna learn everything that there was about it. And so I self-taught everything from scratch. And I guess um when you're in positions like that, it's just like I believe in the power of the universe and um in that moment when I decided that this is what I was going to do, it just felt like, have you ever made a decision and just felt like this is it? Mm -hmm. It's like a sigh of relief is like, this is it. And from then, everything just, you know, like started coming together, you know, like people then that I started meeting were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I can teach you, I can show you a thing or two, you know. Um, I can, someone was like, yeah, I actually will give you a software for Lightroom. I'll crack it and put it like I can't say this, like, but yeah, <laughs> and I started from there, you know, um, so that was really helpful. But again, circling back from the rambling, why did I choose photography as the medium to tackle the issues that I tackle in my work? And um, this was because I felt so oppressed and um, judged, discriminated against, and like, I felt like no one was listening to me when it, it came to what I wanted, what I felt to present, like, you know, I didn't want to go in the world presenting as someone that I'm not. And within that time, you know, I'd started speaking up, like, you know, doing my activism about like queer rights and all of that. And um, people started reaching out, you know, like the, uh, I won't, I don't know how to phrase it, but like when photographers from outside countries Fly in, in for a day or two. <laughs> the you know, like flying for a day or two and hit you up. Hey, D, you know, like, um, so I heard that you were beaten last time for being queer. So can we do an interview? Like, can I take a couple of photos with you? And for me, that didn't settle well because I realized, like, first of all, they didn't give us enough time to even share. And like, when you accepted to do the interviews, it was about how they wanted to to represent you. They didn't care about how you wanted to be portrayed. And I was also thinking so deeply about um, the after effects of that. You come in, you have literally two days, you know, which is mm -hmm. the other days flying out. And you're asking me for to share my traumatic story with you. Relieve the trauma so you can get um, what you want out of that and, and, and leave. You know, you don't check in after that. There's no follow-up. There's nothing. It's just like, oh, you give me access and thank you, bye. You know, um, they go out and obviously use the images however they want because we give consent. So that didn't stay well with me because I felt like it literally like took me back into more depression because why do I have to relive these moments for a person who is not even going to like give me enough time, right? And so I decided that um, I was going to be the one to um, photograph my community, you know, um, and be able to tell our stories with dignity, without sexualization, without the whole stigmatization and all of that, because I felt like, you know, there was a lot of trauma porn situation going on. Um, and I didn't want that because the first thing that I thought about doing was to celebrate our bravery. 
you know. Yes, there's been a lot of uh, mob justice. People have been killed, you know. They have been attacked within the communities um, by the police. Like, I've experienced a lot, you know. And so in that moment, I, 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 was, I was focusing on the fact that we were still there, you know. And at that moment, I had also, like, started meeting people who are like us because... Um, because the queer community in Uganda is very, very scarce. It's like very intact in the sense that um, if you're not out there, then you literally don't exist because they need to also trust you, right? That you're really a part of the community to be able to give you the access, safety reasons, right? And so um, I started obviously, you know, connecting to people who are like me and experiencing this. And I decided like, why not celebrate our bravery? Like we still against all odds, against everything, all the injustices, all the oppression, we're still here. You know, we're still winging it. We're still trying to be authentic every day, even if it means that our freedom is a pain, you know? And so that's how I decided, I was like, okay, we're gonna take matters into our hands and, you know, like <laughs> show up and take up space because if they can do it, we can also do it, right? And so I decided that like, you know, going into this, I'm definitely not going to be like, you know, a one time thing. Like I started meeting a lot of people and obviously having conversations without even going with my camera for a very long time. And this is when I was working on the kingdom, the kingdom in transition. It's still an ongoing project, but it's uh, basically um, an imaginary community or like world, you know, like a fantasy where people can be themselves, you know. Boys can wear dresses and can wear pink and makeup. It's not a taboo in that world, you know, like there is no gender because it's a spectrum. So people can show up in any way that they feel like they want to be perceived. And I guess also like that inspired me to um, start focusing on like um, not necessarily directing my photographs or like the people that I photograph, like simply I just ask them to show up and pose in a way they want to be perceived, you know, like um, by the world, because it's important for me to remember that like the camera, you know, um, it's a very strong tool, but it can also be intimidating. And in many cases, um, when you show up in that sense, it's just like you already have a sense of power over the person you're photographing. So in that moment, there is a lot of um, performative, you know, like I don't know the word, but like the performing that happens for the because people tend to perform for the camera. I mean, I myself, like when someone points a camera at me, I'm like, OK, I don't know how to act. I don't know what to do. Right. So I decided that I was going to take my time with this and let people have that freedom to tell their stories, you know, through the images themselves and also through the quotes. Like, you know, um, I asked them why it means for them to be a part of like the projects that I do or like, you know, explain exactly like what I'm working at and the dangers of like, you know, um, being a part of this project. Because, again, we have to think about safety. And so, um, yeah, then they pose in a way that they want, like they feel comfortable. This is how I want to be perceived by the world. And today I'm going to show up as, you know, glitter and rainbow because that's how I feel, right? And yeah, so I guess um, I might have gone <laughs> over the whole question, but I think somewhere in there I still answered that to maybe or something. No, I mean, you, now you give me like a million more things to ask, but I mean, I'm just in awe. I think that you just touched on so many things of one, just building that rapport, because like you said, you can't just like come and you can't just demand the right to enter somebody's space and to take photos of them or for them to tell their stories. And like you said, ask them to relive their trauma. So, I mean, one thing I wanted to really touch on, because like you said, Uganda is a very homophobic place. It's taboo. There's risk involved for you and for your the people you are photographing. So what do you keep in mind with that? How do you keep yourself and then them also safe um, as best as you can? Um, so I guess like, again, the most important thing is like being really, really open and transparent on how the images are going to be used on what risks, because some people might just be excited to be in front of the camera, but like, it is my job as a photographer to be able to explain exactly what this means 
it is like you i'm taking your photo it's gonna be up on my website maybe and like obviously it's gonna be in my portfolio and i'm gonna be sharing it for work but like you have to know that these are the consequences again we can't forget that we are in uganda you know and so um to put yourself out there like that it comes with risks so with risks right so explaining deeply and also um obviously like paying so much attention to where i'm photographing from you know what i mean like if i did have the choice like to photo or, or the freedom to photograph in the streets of kampala you know and like we just splash the streets with rainbows and glitter and all this love and magic like i would love that that's what i would go for you know but because that we have to be very cautious about like um the spaces where we photograph from because i'm talking about this particularly because it's a very very important uh safety factor uh my camera was confiscated because um i was photographing in a space that maybe i hadn't and i mean i thought it was a safe space because you know we used to do underground parties like you know the whole queer parties but with passwords because you have to think about safety oh shit, my power just went off i hope it doesn't affect anything sorry it's still good okay, still good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um yeah so in the sense of like um sorry i kind of like lost my you were talking about um the just the queer underground parties and you thought it was safe oh. but your camera was yeah 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 so like we did attend like a couple of like um underground parties obviously with um password which are password protected because of safety so i used to reach out to a lot of like you know these um houses and most of them were like for my white friends who could afford like big yards and stuff right to be able to safely photograph from there because again we couldn't just be anywhere and like most of the people however much i would have wanted i always prefer to go to people's spaces because then i think about like the comfortability you know for them to show up as they are without having to feel like you know um imposed on a certain space and whatever but like where most of the people stay it's also like non-safe because neighbors are peeping around as i said our freedom is a huge pain and it's a huge risk and so um even your neighbor can give you in and say like oh i think this person is gay and then they'll come at you and they'll imprison you you know um i, I feel like they've been trying to bring back and forth the whole um kill the guest bill and i feel like they keep throwing it in you know whenever they feel like they want to distract anyone from the current issues and the sad part about that is like every time they try to introduce it or even talk about it in the parliament it tends to make the community really mad and like for them to take matters in their hands because every single time it's been and the latest one was i think 2019 no actually I think during, I think it was 2021, you know, and then there was a couple of queer people that were killed, you know, within that space because people feel like if the government is against us, why can't they just take matters in their hands? So I explained to the people that I work with, my participants, that like, hey, these are the risks, your face is going to be out there and that you have to be cautious and i also explained to them that cons your consent matters and at any given time you can feel free to you know like take it back and just be like hey i have really thought about this i've sat with it yes the images are gorgeous but hey i am not ready and i'll take the necessary steps to not include those images going forward and also i tend to share my um images that like so that people can feel like they have a choice to pick whichever images they feel like best um, represent them. And so that's all I keep to share. So like it's it's a collaborative um, process from beginning to end, because again, we are all involved, right? From just thinking about the safety of my participants, but also mm -hmm. my own safety as well. As a parent, I'm constantly worried about like, you know, what if like this goes, um, into like you know to, to to my family or whatever because at some point i had to move from home because after they confiscated my camera and like some you know personal information they used that like the police used to call me and harass me 
and threatened me that they were gonna put me on a blacklist um in in uganda so like i'm on a wanted list or whatever and apparently i don't know exactly what was the intention but i ended up changing my phone number and i ended up moving away from home because i didn't want my family to be affected by that and so it was just like you know having to constantly unroot yourself to be able to protect the people that you care about but also yourself as well because again i'm as an activist yes i do want myself out there because like what i'm fighting for is important but at the same time you know um i also know that like what i'm fighting for is not gonna be fruitful for me right but mm -hmm. i care about the legacy that i'm leaving behind i care about the people that are gonna come after me i care about my child you know for like because the, I, I i think constantly about that like i don't want my child to have the or like the children of my childish generation to constantly have to worry about the, their freedom of expression to us mm -hmm. constantly hide behind closed doors to constantly feel like they can't be themselves you know in their own country and the other day i was thinking about like the idea of home and belonging and i ended up just putting like random thoughts out but i was like with personally i've never had a home you know because i feel like home has always been associated to family you know and like maybe the country where we come from but like for me i'm like none of that has ever been home my own family doesn't understand me you know like they don't literally they, they don't understand me nor will me explaining it to even the simplest breakdown of like what i am or like what i do they won't get it and i respect that you know and so I was like, we never belonged. I never belong. I never belong to home. I never belong to family. I never belong to anything. But like, I've always belonged to me because I feel like home should be the place where you go back to, you know, to reconcile, to rejuvenate, to celebrate, to grieve, to, um, I don't know. And I feel like, you know, within this notion of like finding home and finding, um trying to find belonging we kind of like stray away from ourselves you know forgetting that at the end of the day it's who we come back to you know within ourselves we are home and i feel like we have never really given ourselves i personally i'll speak for myself i've never really given myself a chance to come back home to me you know what i mean and so i guess from that moment of realization i'm like okay i'm a black queer <laughs> non-binary person because like first of all as a black person you're a threat to the world you know you're angry you're loud and um as a queer person obviously with all the injustices and all of that that is happening the oppression the discrimination you know like we don't even we are not entitled to health care you know it's just like we are less human within our own country and not even just our own country but like you know to all other spaces that we feel like we need to belong to but like no one gives us the access right so with all of that that is happening i'm like hey you know um as a non-binary person it's I, I feel like this has been happening i mean it's it's been present for the longest time but now people are starting to come out more as non-binary but like even within our com own community we are alienated you know what i mean people are like okay why don't you just choose if you want to be a man or a woman but i'm like i don't want to be any of that like that's who i don't resonate to any of that right and so there's always been um that the, the the whole you know like the cloud of like um being an outcast you know of like the not belonging to any type of box that are created within ourselves within our community within our society and like so from the, our freedom being a pain it also means that every day is a protest you know i feel like my whole life is a protest because every breakdown of that makes a part of me it's a protest it's not accepted in some community society places people whatever and so i decided that i'm gonna show up and take up space because why not you know what i mean if i don't speak up who's gonna speak up for me right again as i said i'm the only non-binary queer photographer or even a queer photographer in the whole of uganda so there is no representation for me and now that also means that there is a lot of pressure <laughs> on me to kind of like you know pave a space for others to feel free to come up 
you know, like to motivate and inspire and just be like, hey, it's okay. You know, it's okay to be yourself. Even in the world where it was like you can never make it, but you pave your own way and, you know, show up and take up space. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, what do I say after that? <laughs> I mean, everything that you just shared, um, you know, it's going to take up space. Absolutely. You know, we just talked about physical safety and just meant how you handle that. But I want to talk about like mental, like mental health, mental safety. When you're telling these stories, I'm about to share my screen again um and go to one of your projects through the cracks that's ongoing you know how do you just like there's the physical safety aspect but there's the mental aspect you know like you said you're paving the way you are the first you have that weight on your shoulders but then also telling these stories that are heavy this one is about domestic violence how do you then just like i don't know just i guess what i'm trying to say is like how do you just like how do you just really release this at the end of the day? Can you release this? Like after you hear somebody's story um, and you handle it with such care, but then does it become like, a, I don't know. Do you do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I hear you. Um, I don't know. So I guess that it kind of helps that like most of the projects that I work on, like the, the personal, again, I'm available for other assignments that are non-personal <laughs> projects. <laughs> I'm free, hey, but <laughs> but um, when I work on personal projects, most of the times they're inspired by my own experiences. Um, so that means like it's also a way of healing, you know. We've been like by me creating the body of work, or, like the way I process it, it's my way of process, it's my way of healing because these experiences I've gone through myself. Particularly through the cracks, um, this project right here literally just made history because it won the East African Photography Award. This has never happened before because I think the East African Photography Award is, is organized by the Uganda Press Photo Awards and it's been running for six years. And I'm the very first queer person to have won it. But also this was the very first queer project to win it. And I mean, we're talking about East Africa, like with all the homophobia and stuff. So um, that is like a history in itself because wow, you know what I mean? And so this particular project is also like a really, really um, special project to me. It resonates a, a lot with me because it's my lived experience. My very first partner was um, abusive in many ways than one. And I remember being so um, lip, like lip tight because I couldn't share the experience with anyone. I couldn't talk to anyone. There was no resources of like us queer people going to a space and being like, hey, my partner or my girlfriend beat me because, you know, people look at you like, what? You know, you're weak or whatever, right? And so um, I guess like what inspired that or like what stayed with me because even if it happened like a couple years ago, it was the fact that um, my ex went out drinking. This was normal. And they came back to me and um, they wanted to have sex with me in front of my friend who was my housemate, right? And so within that moment, I'm like, hey, I really don't feel like doing this. And um, they just kept on like pushing and pushing and pushing. And at this point, they're like really nailing me down. And I call out to my friend and I'm like, hey, can you please help me? And they were like literally right there. Like, can you please help me get them off of me? And my friend's response, like, I'll never forget that. She was like, yeah, but like, aren't you guys already having sex? Like, you're together, right? So, and you're, you're literally girls. So, <laughs> you know, so this whole idea that like, you know, um, this intimate partner violence doesn't exist within um, same-sex relationship is literally like the biggest myth I've ever heard. Because for the fact, like, you know, um, in Uganda, and even in, like in Uganda, well, I understand that's excusable because, again, we are illegal, right? Which also makes it very difficult to go anywhere to even the police to report anything because where are you going to go? Who are you going to talk to? Because when you go to report something, you're going to end up in jail yourself, the victim, right? 
And um, I realized that when I came here also, I was starting still to research that because I actually got a fellowship to work on this like as a year long um, um, here in South Africa. And um, I realized that also here, there's no resources, you know, whereas the gender-based violence, the gender-based violence is mostly affiliated with heteronormality, right? Meaning that there's all these resources, like you buy paper bags that have, you know, end GBV right now, but like that does that same urgency and the resources that are available for that, are, are they also available for the queer people? If I show up as a queer person and report that I've been beaten, are they going to tend to me the same way they would, you know, if it was the other way? Forgetting, I feel like um, this puts us in a position, as queer people, it puts us in a position where um, since you already have um, to fight for your own rights, you know, you focus on that and like you don't tackle any other issue because, hello, you can't. It's like you can't concentrate on any other issue apart from fighting for your freedom, which is really, really wrong because that dehumanizes us. It's like at the end of the day, before being queer, we are humans, right? We do have feelings. We have emotions. We experience exactly what everyone else experiences. And so um, let me first answer before I ramble <laughs> in, deep into the project. How do I debrief, you know, um, dealing with all these topics is um, dance. I do, I do love, it's, I wouldn't even call it dance because I suck at dance religiously, but I do movement, <laughs> you know, like I love to um, free myself and um, literally let music influence every part of me. You know what I mean? So like, I keep moving with every part of my body and just kind of like, and um, that, like, if I'm on a dance floor and the vibe is amazing and the energy is good and the music is dope, I literally close my eyes and ground myself in that moment and let myself go. Because if I don't do that, I don't feel like I'm able to go out and hold space. Like with these projects or like these um doing work like this you're constantly holding space for other people you know but at the end of the day most of the times you don't really have any other person to hold space for you and i mean i would also say therapy but um therapy is expensive you know <laughs> so i wouldn't <laughs> and it's very an inaccessible you know to many of us you know we i i i can't afford full-time therapy, you know, as um, as much as I would have wanted. So I do have different little ways in how to kind of like, you know, debrief myself. So that's through dancing. Um, and also kind of like I have a small group of people within my life where um, I literally check in, hey, are you able to hold space for me in this moment? You know, this is what I'm going through at the moment. Are you able to hold space in this moment? And yeah, so most of the times the answer is yes. And sometimes when it's a no, I understand they're also going through their shit. So I have to wait until they're able to like hold space for me so I can kind of process it. But it, as I said, again, it's through making this work that I process, you know, because I tend to think about it as a collective healing space, you know, collective healing process. Why I say collective is like all of these people that allow me in their spaces, that give me the privilege to tell their stories are also going through the trauma. You know what I mean? And so it's important for us to, as a community, to kind of find a space where we collectively come together. And as I say, like, I really take time with my projects. And so that means like, you know, there's a lot of prepping and building trust and, you know, to come to the moment where like it's the image making, we are already collectively, you know, um, sharing within ourselves and kind of like, you know, being there for each other and providing the support that we can't get elsewhere, you know. And so, um, yeah, so this project, again, it has kind of like, you know, um, became somewhat a research project because I was really curious to find out, like, what is the contrast between the legality of homosexuality, I mean, here in South Africa, and the illegality of it in Uganda, and if that meant that here we get more resources. And then you find out that uh, most of the setups are formalities, you know, and so what I've started doing actually is doing Zen workshops um, 
with these Zen workshops, it's like, you know, um, a way to provide space for people who are not comfortable being on camera, even though I offer the idea or the content, yeah, the idea of anonymity, as you can see in my work, I tend to really like, even if someone gives me full access and they're like, hey, go ahead, do this. I'm like, okay, but we need to think about the aftermath as well, right? So I tend to do like that anonymity way of like, yes, capturing, photographing people, but at the same time also um, giving them a chance to not appear because of the sensitivity of it, right? And um, so it's become a space where like I do go around doing workshops with people, different queer communities in South Africa and um same way holding space because i realized that most people even when they're being abused they don't even realize that they're being abused or even the abusers sometimes don't even realize that they're being they're abusing right and um this came through obviously in the process of me trying to like you know make the images for the project and so i decided okay so this is a space actually to teach people about like the different forms and kinds of violence you know it's not just about um physical it's not just physical it's not just emotional but also like intimacy goes to platonic you know it can be like you know it's rooted deeply you know to family society and all of that and also the other important thing is holding space for both the abuser and the abused because we are digging deep to the root cause of the problem why are people feeling this way you know um and i tend to say that like just be, just because we are queer as i said again at the end of the day we are human first meaning if we grew up in abusive families we're taking these traits with us you know it doesn't be like oh but you're queer you're you're good you know <laughs> it doesn't work like that so i have been um doing zen workshops let me show you just uh an example sorry quickly no thank you um and if you have any questions for day loving please put them in the chat. We will get through a few before we wrap up. Um, so this is like um, an example of a Zen workshop where um, people who don't feel free, who, who don't feel comfortable to be photographed or to be on camera, they get to freely um, tell their story through this little booklet. And um, so that kind of provides them with um, the free form of um, sharing in a way that resonates with them, you know, like creatively. And um, again, for all of us to kind of like, you know, sit with our traumas, realize our triggers, and at the same time be able to express that in a way that um, helps us release, you know, let out. So as I said, this is also like a healing process for me because I get to meet people who have gone through the same experience and um, kind of hold space for them to um, share their stories in a way that resonates with them. So it's definitely not necessarily the photography route, but it also is a way of storytelling and it gives more power to the people. And also um, the movement therapy where um, I play music and let people... <laughs> Let's all <laughs> vibe and groove, but like in a way that like, you know, to let it out and um, stay grounded within ourselves. Yeah. I mean, that is just so beautiful and just so creative as well. And so important. I'm glad that you are finding a way to release that um, as best as you can, because like you said, therapy <laughs> is a lot. Um, I want to go to one more project um, before we wrap up. It's one of my favorite projects, the I Am Woman. Uh, okay, so with everything that you do, I mean, just like, I mean, like we we're just talking about movement and I just see how people are such at ease, even how, even if they're so vulnerable as to just, you know, be bare. Talk to us about that and this project in particular. And I guess, you know, what advice would you have for people who are wanting to capture these, you know, gender and identity um, issues as well? Um, I am woman. Where do I even start? <laughs> <laughs> I know, this could be a whole hour in itself. <laughs> I know, right? But um, I think in short, I would say that this is a project that is simply celebrating the power of the pussy because i don't think that we give the pussy enough you know clout <laughs> like it deserves because hello um the pussy literally does 
<laughs> create life. It's a pathway for life, right? And um, honestly, I think I am woman. I like what I wanted to do with that is simply to um as I said, like celebrate the pussy, but in a way to acknowledge the movement, the empowerment that has been happening, the work that women have been doing, you know, to um, empower each other and create some sort of unit, unity and encourage speaking up within ourselves because um, this particular project was, um, was inspired by the Me Too uh, movement. Mm. And I remember um, during that time, it was like a lot that was going on, you know? I feel like we started seeing a lot of conversations between men, like who thought they were woke. And in this moment, they didn't know what to do with themselves because I feel like most of the times they never really get called out. So most of the time, most of the men during that time were really, really having a hard time to deal with this. And I saw a collective um, pioneer movement of like women coming together to be like, hey, this is our time to speak up, you know, about this that has been happening for the longest time and celebrate us in whichever form and, you know, shape that we come in. And again, like I grew up with no representation. The only women I ever saw were like, my mother, who is a single um, woman who raised us, but also like literally I feel like this was the norm when it came to like my village because every woman was a single parent. You know what I mean? So I grew up around like very strong black women who looked nothing like the internet right now. You know what I mean? And I kind of wanted to like do a project that represented women that looked like my mother, you know, but at the same time also include you know like my um trans sisters who have been fighting to be included in the womanhood you know it's like they have to constantly fight for their womanhood like prove the valid validity english yo <laughs> They have constantly have to fight about like, you know, the, the validity of womanhood within the the um the frame of being a woman is just like within the community itself, it's just like again, there's transphobia within the community itself, but also on the outside, these people are also not um accepted. So I wanted to include that and show people that like being a woman is not just one way, you know, let's quit the whole stereotype of like, okay, women are supposed to be like this or a particular way because that's not reality, you know, in this era and this time, everything is changing. We are evolving. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing at the. <laughs> no, I couldn't help myself. Okay, this is not my first language, believe it or not. So I just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah english is a problem we accept but yeah like so it was more about like you know um wanting to acknowledge that these sisters are, are part of us you know um being a woman shouldn't be just for a particular you know um type of way or like you you can't just present a certain way and i feel like also like you know to defy the whole gender roles you know i grew up around like um as in the like i would so back in the day childhood d a girl right in my communities like you move around and you have to kneel down when you're greeting the men you know or like greeting everyone in the community as a girl you were required to kneel down when you start wearing a dress or a skirt it's like you had to keep your um, legs crossed so that like you don't seduce the men because they can't keep their eyes to themselves and they can't control themselves you know so it's all put on the women to kind of like you know control how men's genitals work and i'm like why are you giving us all this responsibility because at the end of the day with the rape culture women are still blamed blamed oh my god Bl <laughs> women are still blamed. Just saying, don't worry <laughs> oh my god i'm doing the most but again like <laughs> rape culture women are constantly blamed it's just like the first questions that people are asking is like oh what time was it why were you moving at that time without anyone Oh my God, have you made that one? Do you know how that one dresses? You know, it's definitely a seduction problem. 
oh so um why were you at that bar like why did you leave your drink unattended you know and i'm like why are men not taking any accountability you know we are tired of having to defend ourselves with even things that are done to us you know i'm right now in a country in south africa where it's like the highest femicide you know women here feel like entitled to women's body and if you tell me that you want me and i'm like no thank you it's a problem men are not like told that no is an, a genuine answer because there is even this joke of like oh no means yes for women like what the hell right so again <laughs> i'm like no we have to put a stop to this and i feel like you know i was again so inspired by women coming up and defying the whole stereotype of like oh these people are so emotional or they're very sensitive or like whatever but to speak up for what they believed was the truth because the questions that were arising is like why you, do you choose now like again they're always they will always try to find a way to pin it on the woman regardless of what happened and I mean, we've seen the big names of people who have been arrested within the Me Too movement. They're now free and out, right? And it's not okay. It shouldn't be okay. So this is, again, a place, you know, just like any trends, you know, Me Too was there and it was powerful and, you know, it survived for a, 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 a while, you know. But again, we are in the era of the internet, right? The trend comes and goes. And I wanted this project to stay there to remind women that we, that... <laughs> Oh my God. To remind women that they are badass. I'm non binary. But, like, again, I feel like I constantly have to be brought back into the women filter because, I mean, like, still no one recognizes my, my non binarity. And I feel like with a lot of opportunities that come up, you know, uh, most of them are women centered and, like, there's no place for us. So we always have to end up fixing ourselves in the boxes that we don't even fit in. And again, it's like a thing that is now like in my head because I constantly have to be a woman to fit in, you know, in a space where like I'm not accommodated for as a non-binary person. So I wanted this like be, after the trend of the Me Too kind of, you know, like slow down, I wanted women to remember that they're still powerful, you know, to still celebrate themselves, whichever body shape, body size, you know, how they present, to defy the whole gender norms and whatnot. Like, we're not supposed to be, right. like, how do I even say this? For women to remember that, again, regardless of everything, they're still powerful beings, you know, they can still own up their space, they can still show up and take up space without having to answer to men, you know? And at the end of the day, that like, yes, with the Me Too gone, there is still like a revolution that was created for us, by us, through all the path that we've lived, you know, our experiences and all of that. We are powerful and we should always remember that. So celebrating the power of the pussy all the way. Yeah. I want to take one question from Maria um, before we go. Um, they asked, because of your constraints to take photos, are most of your photos taken in natural light? I am a natural light person. <laughs> How do I answer that? So literally like all of my images are natural light. Um, I do know how to take studio photos, but I tend to want um, to have a, a lot more control when I'm making my images. And I'm not, again, this is not to, you know, kind of uh, put down one way of like working things. But personally, I prefer natural light because I feel like, you know, I get to have more control, you know. And because I also prefer to work around with light and shadow so if you've seen my work it's like you know it's like a consistent trademark because i didn't want to come in looking like what everyone does i wanted to come in unique and different so that when you see my work you're like oh that's d right and so i walk around with a lot of light and shadows and so um it really helps for me to be outside. So even if in the house i'm always looking for the light where the source of the light so as Polly, like i'm looking at your you know, like your screen, and I'm like, in the corner there, there's that light, you know? <laughs> so I'm I know my lighting setup is, could be better. <laughs> I'm always seeing light and shadows because that's mm -hmm. how my eyes work. That's how I see. So natural light, definitely all the way. So I have to 
be mindful about the spaces that I go in, but at the same time also know that like the natural light is there for me to work around. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dee. Um, I guess before we go, you know, like you said, you are breaking barriers. Um, as Mo put it in the chat, did you feel that this would be, you know, that younger you would think that you'd be doing this, being the first? I mean, I know that take, that feels like that carries a lot of weight. So like, I don't know, like what would you want to say to your future self and how do you, you know, just navigate being the first of so many things in a place that it's not safe to do so? So younger D in many different ways wouldn't have Young D wouldn't have imagined any of this because um, I have unfortunately blocked out a lot of my childhood because it was very hurtful, you know. Um, I was molested, you know, and constantly raped for four years from the age of six until I was 10. And I didn't speak up until I was 21. And I guess that... Um, in many ways, I feel like my voice was always constrained. It was always shut down. Like, you know, I tended to just keep to myself. And um, yeah, that was um, a problem. And I think like it, influ I allowed it to influence a lot of my experiences um, growing up and in life. I didn't have any friends. I couldn't connect with anyone. I had a lot of like, you know, self esteem issues and all of that so definitely young d wouldn't have dreamt to be where i am right now and i'm just really really grateful to the world to to the universe that i was able to kind of like channel my experiences you know however traumatic they were to find my strength you know and again i'm not even a fan of being like oh you have to suffer so you can be something no, but like, again, that's my reality is that I went through all of this. And like, for the longest time, I didn't know how to deal with it because I didn't even know how to speak up. Right. And then um, I had to channel my trauma into strength to kind of like find my voice to be able to speak up. And I guess this is why I'm so passionate about what I do, because I'm like, in that moment, like I was. I bottled up a lot, you know, and I feel like I want to, I need it. I need to let it out. And also like, you know, provide in the same process, provide for me, it's not just making photos. It's not just putting my work out there. It's not just awards. It's not just about that, but it's holding space for the people who barely get it, you know, who are, what is the word who, again, for us who can't afford therapy, you know, to collectively, be able to share space and hold space for one another because it's really, really important to speak up. When we bottle a lot, this is why we have a lot of anger, you know, going around. And um, I feel like it's our generation, it's on us to cut down on the, to, to like end the trauma cycle, you know? And we can, we can do it, you know, like by holding space for our children and our friends and family and, um, kind of reminding them that it's okay to share, it's okay to speak up, it's okay to create spaces like this where um, people feel free to be themselves fully and truly and authentically and as raw as we can. It's important for me. I never got that growing up. And so um, as the like adult D, like beyond now, <laughs> Um, I just say, like, keep grinding, you know, keep um, embracing who you are. The world will meet you in the middle. Um, regardless, don't stop. You know, you have to keep moving. Um, yes, I work in very unsuitable situations, very unsafe. I constantly worry about my safety and my child is. But at the same time, I'm like, if I don't do this, then who is going to do it for me? You know, and um, yeah, so I keep going because again, showing up and taking up space. Dee, I, I cannot thank you enough. You have been so open and vulnerable and just so raw and just uh, your transparency, everything about you. I mean, you know this. <laughs> I mean, I'm just so grateful that you took the time. You were so candid. Um, you know, when I think about just like, 
how you move, but also just like what you have done in such a short amount of time with no blueprints, with no one else's lead to follow. I hope you know how important you are as a person and then the work second, but the work you're doing to impact others and give them the space. Um, so I just want to give you your flowers before we go. <laughs> I do. Um, if I don't say it enough, I really do. Um, I guess one last thing, you know, what advice would you have for others who may not be in a position to take up that space yet? Um, first of all, thank you for the flowers. I really do appreciate that, like, so much. Um, again, I think the most important advice is we don't really heal from trauma, you know? We can't fully heal from trauma because it's like what happened happened. You can't turn back time. You can't change what happened to you. So um, it's us. It's up to us to find ways to live with the trauma, you know, to constantly process it. Allow yourself to be open to learning and unlearning and relearning because again we evolve, we grow, we change. So you don't constant, you don't completely heal from trauma, but like you can find ways on how to live with it without letting it affect you. For the things that I've gone through and the things that I'm still going to go through, because again I'm still here. As long as you're still here, shit is still gonna happen. So. <laughs> You just constantly have to allow yourself to feel everything. You know, when things happen, and I understand not everyone is able to do this. It's a process. You know what I mean? Allow yourself to create space within yourself to process things where you can. Allow yourself to feel all that you need to feel before you move on and forgetting about it or try to bottle it. Because when you keep trying to bottle shit up, it's still going to show up at the most unexpected of times. At some point in my life, I thought I'd, you know, like dealt with the molestation, but I, it, it still shows up in some ways. And I just have to relearn in that moment to still um, allow myself to process, you know, again, we learn more ways to process things, um, coping mechanisms, you know, try to know and identify your, your triggers so that like, you know, in the moment when you experience that, you know that uh, maybe I need to take a break and maybe I need to um, kind of like separate myself from this situation at the moment. Or maybe if I'm at a party and I'm feeling like my social battery is low, it's like all of it is in self care. It's in self love. And I'm not saying that I'm an expert of this and like I know how to deal with my shit. I have days where I can't get out of bed. That's the honest truth, you know, where I'm really not in the position to even be out there to even talk to anyone because it's just like i am so overstimulated or overwhelmed and this happens like unconsciously most of the times and please um therapy is no longer for just white people if anything it should actually be free for black people because of the shit that we've um have had to experience and so I hope that that's like something that gets thought about. So therapy is free for black people. <laughs> White people can facilitate our therapy because at the end of the day, you know. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like, um, again, remember, there's no timeline for healing. So don't put a timeline on your healing and be like, oh my God, I've been dealing this for four years. Like, why am I not there? There's no timeline. Be graceful and kind to yourself and allow yourself time to constantly process when needed yes Ooh, there's no timeline i the i'm gonna have to rewatch this a few times thank you thank you thank you thank you seriously i am so sorry for going over time but i think this needed the space and thank you for just you know giving space with your work for others and i hope you know we can all take up as much space as you so thank you, thank you. <laughs> I mean, I don't have a plan B. I don't have a plan B. There is no going back. So I have to keep going forward. Like that is the only way. So yeah. Right. <laughs> we, we need to start the petition. <laughs> we need and free therapy for black people. It's important. We need to start the petition. Thank you again so much. And thank you all who tuned in. 
please, you know, continue to support Dee's work. Um, I really can't thank you enough. This has been such a beautiful conversation. So thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks for everyone. It's been interesting to watch the comments flowing in and stuff. <laughs> Me motivated. So thank you so much, Polly, for holding space again for me as well to be able to share my story. And um, as I was saying, like I've struggled a lot um, from coming where I come from. Many people don't want to be associated to the work that I'm doing because it's sensitive. And you know, as organizations, mm -hmm. no one wants to be affiliated with the person who creates queer work because again of the um, consequences that might happen. So thank you for giving me a space to um fully be myself and fully um take up space and share my story you know because it's important for us to be heard and seen because we're constantly seeking for that so thank you for giving me that i really appreciate it really truly thank you <sighs> thank you <laughs> thank you everyone for tuning in um this of course has been recorded and don't worry you can replay it as many times as me and get the field to take up Bays, this was very therapeutic. Thank you, Dee, and thank you everyone for listening. Bye, everyone. Bye.